what I want to do is just uh, continue on with uh, the outline here of the Spanish colonialism. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, Nicolas de Ovando was governor of the Indies uh, from 1502 to 1509 after Columbus uh, and after uh, uh, Bobadilla, okay. And at this time now, given the intercathera uh, bowl of Pope Ag Alexander VI, um, importation of African slaves into the Americas is quite prevalent. Uh, along with that, there is ruthless suppression of indigenous tribal revolts, you know, uh, Ovando is treating the indigenous population brutally as, you know, the overall governor of the territory, and there's lots of revolts going on. Um, now, this does cause some controversy back in Spain, especially with Queen Isabella. She She's kind of a, a, a character who is sympathetic to the plight of the indigenous Americans. And this is one indication um, where uh, Ovando is recalled for, uh, and, and his governorship is, is uh, terminated because of his cruel treatment of the indigenous population. Um, now, he, in, he defends his treatment of the indigenous people under the concept of Ocomienda. Uh, so his understanding of Encomienda is that he can exact tributes. He can exact it in uh, labor or in gold or in blood, right? And, and so... Uh, you know, if he's going to extract this wealth from them, then he must be given the full extent of the law to enforce that extraction of wealth in his mind. Uh, but evidently, his interpretation of encomienda was not... Uh, commensurate with the way that encomienda was applied on the Iberian Peninsula in the previous centuries. Okay, and, and I talked about that uh, back in a previous video. So by the time of 1513, there is the Spanish requirement uh, which is a decree of the crown of Isabella and Ferdinand that when an indigenous tribe is met and they, you know, uh, well, when they are first met, when they're still sort of peaceful relations, they're read a document in Spanish, which of course the indigenous Americans did not understand Spanish, but they were officially read by some of officiate this document that said uh, if they failed to surrender, then you know, then they would be slaughtered. Um, all in Spanish, they couldn't understand it, uh, but it was some kind of officious sort of legal mumbo jumbo to to. Uh, to justify the wholesale slaughter of indigenous peoples. So you see this kind of incremental escalation of, of, of the violence where Isabella at some point was able to constrain uh, Ovanda, but, uh, but uh, Ovando, but, um, but then 
not too long after there's some kind of legal construct um, put in place around wholesale slaughter of indigenous people. <clears throat> Diego Columbus is the son of Christopher Columbus and he becomes governor of the Indies in 1508 and uh, he's Admiral and Viceroy of the Indies by hereditary title. So these, these become hereditary titles. You know, Columbus written, originally was Admiral of the Oceans. Okay, whatever you find, you're, you're Admiral of that. And, and so uh, Diego claims that as a hereditary uh, title. Um, but he gets involved in these Plato's Colombinos, uh, these are court trials in which Diego is trying to legally, within the legal system of the Spanish kingdom, to secure his right to a certain percentage of profits off the colonies and certain titles like Admiral and Viceroy of the Indies and claim to certain lands in perpetuity. Um, and Ferdinand in particular is very antagonistic to this. And, um, and, and these legal battles go through the courts all the way until a, a decade after the death of uh, Diego. And, 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 and there are findings where Diego is, you know, he has some legitimate claim to territories conquered by his father and some legal claim to one-tenth of the net income of the Navy, which is quite substantial. Uh, but these, these trials drag on and drag on uh, well beyond the death of Diego. Uh, he is recalled by King Ferdinand in 1514 from the colonies back to Spain and is no longer the governor at that point. And so, you know, there's this, uh, this controversy between Diego and Ferdinand uh, that persists over years and years and years, even beyond Diego's death. Okay. Um, now, Bar Bartolome de la Casas, now this is our main character in this narrative. Uh, he was born in Seville, the, the city of Seville in 1484, uh, immigrated to Hispaniola, that's the island first founded by, uh, by Columbus, by Christopher Columbus. And he immigrates with Ovando, that governor that we mentioned before in 1502 when he first became governor. So uh, La Casas went out to uh, went out to Hispaniola with uh, Ovando and La Casas was himself an encomendaro. He owned an encomienda. He was the lord of an encomienda, where he asserted his right to the labor and tribute of the indigenous people of the land, uh, you know, granted because of his conquistador status as this avant-garde sort of con conquistador sort of person. So La Casas is, is very much uh, a, a Spanish conquistador himself. He participated in military raids against indigenous tribes. He returned to Spain uh, in 1506 to study canon law. Uh, canon law is uh, the law of the Roman Catholic Church, which was like the international law at the time for Europeans. And so this is law that applied across all countries uh, despite what any country said, canon law, at least technically, just like international law today, has a higher status. But, you know, nations, if they're power enough, powerful enough, they can flout that. But um, 
So he studied canon law at Salamanca, which is a big university town in Spain. He is ordained as a priest uh, in 1507. And, um, and then he returns to Hispaniola, where he has his encomienda. And as an encomendaro, one who is in possession of an encomienda, he was denied relig the religious right of confession. So Roman Catholics uh, practice this right where uh, on a periodic basis, weekly or monthly or whatever the case may be for the individual, they visit the priest and they confess their sins and then the, the, the priest uh, blesses them and forgives their sin and gives them some sort of penance as a as a way of absolving their sins and La Casas was denied this central feature of Roman Catholic religious tradition by the Dominican friars uh, for because he practiced slavery in their mind uh, under Ovadondo's interpretation of encomienda, right? So Ovanda interpreted encomienda to, to authorize the most brutal uh, slavery of indigenous people. And La Casas was practicing that along with everybody else. Uh, and he was denied the right of confession and this, of course, is a big crisis in his life because he himself was an ordained priest. Um, so that, that was quite, that was quite, um, you know, disruptive, uh, caused some cog cognitive dissonance for him. Now, in the wake of this, he argues for encomienda against the Dominicans. And so he becomes a kind of political public figure who is arguing on the behalf of the Encomendaros against the Dominicans. And uh, maybe in part because of his effectiveness as a rhetorician, the Dominicans are soon expelled from Hispaniola. Uh, by Diego Columbus, who is the governor, and this is in 1511. Uh, shortly thereafter, there's the conquest of Cuba, which we saw on the map was is very close to Hispaniola. And Las Casas is, the ch is one of the chaplains in the military, and he sees the atrocities of the conquest up Per, uh, up close and personal. Um, this is a brutal um, genocidal form of warfare where it's not really a war. You know, in a war, there's, there's like two armies. Uh, but in a genocide, there's like one army and then there's just a bunch of people that you just slaughter. That's what the conquistadors were doing. Um, you know, they had uh, superior technology, gunpowder, and horses. Indigenous Americans did not have horses. They did not have steel. They did not have uh, gunpowder. They didn't have guns. Uh, so it's not really a war. Uh, it's just a slaughter. And La Casa saw this up close and personal. And um, in, the, in the midst of this, for his service, he was awarded an encomienda in Cuba. So now he not only has an uh, encomienda in Hispaniola, but also in Cuba. So he's becoming a rather large landlord. <clears throat> And then as he is preparing a sermon in 1514, he comes across <clears throat> a certain passage from Ecclesiasticus. Now, this is part of the King James Bible. Um, so it's part of 
the Protestant Christian tradition, but uh, excluded in subsequent centuries, but um, is still part of the Roman Catholic uh, Bible today, part of the Old Testament, <clears throat> as the Christians call it. Um, and so this was considered holy script, uh, the word of God, uh, at the time that Lacassus was reading it. And, and this is what it says. It says, uh, he that sacrifices a thing wrongly gotten, his offering is ridiculous. And the gifts of unjust men are not accepted. The Most High, God, is not pleased with the offering of the wicked. Neither is he pacified for sin by the multitude of sacrifices. So religious rituals, confessions, whatever, penance. If, if it's by ill-gotten gain, if you got your wealth by ill-gotten gains, it doesn't matter. Whoso bringeth an offering of the goods of the poor doeth as one that killeth the son before his father's eyes. So whosoever, whoso bringeth an offering of the goods of the poor. So if you take the goods, the wealth of a poor person, and then you try to offer that as a sacrifice uh, or an offering to the church, uh, that's like just killing God's son before God's eyes. This is in the Old Testament. This is not a Christian text. <clears throat> but there's obviously like a, in the eyes of Lacassus, this has a Christian tone. It's, you know, prophetic in that way. It's like when you take it out of context, it like suddenly has this other meaning. And uh, that mention of the poor is, is, very poor, is very important, as we will see later on in the course material. Okay. Uh, and then it also says, the bread of the needy is their life. He that defraudeth him thereof is a man of blood. He that has taken away his neighbor's living slayeth him, and he that defraudeth the labor of his hire, of his labor, is a bloodshedder. And so here we see uh, very specifically uh, repudiation of encomienda right here in the Old Testament of the Bible. So if you, if you appropriate and steal the labor of someone, um, that that is equivalent to bloodshed. That you might as well kill the person. And when one buildeth, another pulleth down. What profit profit have they but labor? You know, if if you're just uh, allowing somebody to build something, and then you're just taking it away from them, you're appropriating their labor, then you just created a zero. There's just nothing but turmoil and labor, and there's no product. There's no, there's no benefit. Um, and, and notice the way that this all sounds very kind of Marxist, all right? <clears throat> Uh, when one prayeth and another curses, whose voice will the Lord, Lord hear? Right? If one is praying to God for mercy and another is cursing them, who is God supposed to side with? He that washes himself after the touching of a dead body, if he touch it again, what availeth his washing? So in Hebrew tradition, you know, if you touch a dead body, you would have to go through like a ritual, ritual of clean, clean, cleansing yourself, like the ritual of confession and penance. But if you just go back and do it again, what's the point? 
And so Damacasus is seeing himself as someone who's confessing of sins and probably confessing of his sins of exploiting the indigenous people uh, of his uncomienda. And he keeps confessing, but he just goes back and does it again. And so this is very convicting for him. On a personal level, this is like God speaking to him. So it is with a man that fasteth for his sin, but goeth again and doeth the same. Who will hear his prayer? Is God going to hear the prayer of a person who just keeps on doing it? You know, oh yeah, you do your penance and then you just come back and you confess again. It's like, come on. Or what doth, doth his humbling profit him? Okay, so... Um, for Lacassus, this was very personally convicting. And in the wake of looking at this passage as the text from which he was going to preach as, as a priest uh, to his congregation, uh, Lacassus was, was convicted in his soul personally. And he began dismantling his encomienda. He literally did. And he began to preach uh, out in the streets to his fellow colonists, and he urged them to do the same thing. Very unusual. This is a peculiar fellow. Um, and he met with a lot of resistance, and uh, people were getting angry with him. They're like, "Shut up! We don't want to hear this, and don't tell anybody else this." You know, because obviously that passage. Uh, he found a passage that was particularly incisive. Um, <clears throat> it's not very ambiguous, right? Uh, it's, it seems to be clear. And so ultimately he decided he had to take his argument to, the king, to king Ferdinand. And um, all right, so uh, I will leave off here and then start a new video. We'll, we'll go on from there. All right.